It's time for, uh, as I said, the second session, but also uh, the second Nordic speaker. Uh, Anne, she holds a PhD in nanotechnology and molecular, molecular biology, and she was named PhD Talent of the Year at the Technical University of Denmark in 2019. Uh, she's also a TED speaker, multiple award winner, and in the same year, in 2019, named one of the 30 most influential people under 30 in Europe within health and science by Forbes, which is quite remarkable. Uh, she's a group leader and assistant professor at Roskilde University in Denmark and the founder of the high-tech company Pre-Diagnose, where she has created a next-generation diagnostic system for early bacterial detection. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a very impressive CV and uh, it's my pleasure also to introduce to you Dr. Fatima Alzara Alatrakci. Please, welcome. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me to Nordic Talks Korea. It's a great pleasure and I wish that I was uh, with you, but um, unfortunately the situation is as it is, so we have to do it the high tech way. Um, actually, I was in Korea about five years ago when um, my husband was on the delegation to the country and uh, I took the chance to, to, to explore the city with my daughter uh, back then. Um, but what happened was that in the moment we landed in, uh, in the airport, we discovered that uh, my daughter was, uh, had fever and we had to take her to the doctor already at the airport. And uh, the doctor prescribed antibiotics for her um, and this is actually something that happens very often also here in Denmark, especially on call doctors uh, often prescribe uh, antibiotics for kids. In this particular situation, it was of course uh, justified to, to, uh, to treat uh, an infant when, uh, when we were so uh, far away from home. But in general, we have a problem with overprescription of antibiotics because it creates antimicrobial resistance. And this is the subject I want to talk with you about uh, today. But first of all, what is antimicrobial resistance? Since the beginning of microbial life on Earth, bacteria have fought each other. They secrete small toxins to fight each other and uh, to compete with each other. And it's only because there are so few nutritions. So they have to compete for that and they try to push the other species away by secreting these toxins to kill the others. But these toxins are also the, the, what we humans isolate as antibiotics. Naturally, in, in, uh, in systems, in bacterial systems, the bacteria develop a defense mechanism against these toxins, these antibiotics. But since this happens as a natural process in the environment, it also is something that, is, that, uh, that we shouldn't in, in fact be afraid of. But our problem is that we have consumed so much antibiotics, we have artificially exposed bacteria to so much antibiotics that they, we have accelerated this mechanism of defense. And in the end, we have the situation of antimicrobial resistance, which also means that the bacteria, that the antibiotics are less and less effective and we are actually, we don't have new antibiotics to treat uh, infections with. Which leads us to the post-antibiotic era. Studies show that within a few years, we will die from simple infections. It will be at a higher risk when we go to, to simple surgeries or when we give birth or when, when being wounded, it will all, always be a risk. There will always be a risk of infections that cannot be treated and eventually will kill us. The World Health Organization have estimated that within 
30 years, we will have a, a death rate of 10 million people per year. And the, the antimicrobial resistance will be the main cause of death. So this is, of course, a subject that is that perhaps is more severe than the COVID-19 situation we are facing right now. And a lot of researchers are working to, to find a solution to this, including myself. I'm an assistant professor at the Roskilde University in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, Rook, or Rook, it's a, a university that is known for being very interdisciplinary. So we, we use different scientific skills to solve, uh, what, to, to solve the real world problems. And um, one topic of my research is to, to, to create nano tools, to create nano sensors that can help us uh, diagnose infections early and understand how bacteria behave. But my uh, research started uh, earlier uh, when, and my interest in this subject started earlier when I did a research project at Copenhagen University Hospital. I had developed a sensor that I was testing at the hospital and uh, the idea of the study was that patients with lung infections would, uh, we would set, the, the, the nurses would sample the patients and the sample from the patients was divided into three. So one, one part uh, was uh, used for regular diagnostics at the hospital. Another part was measured on the spot with my sensor. And the third uh, part was saved for validation purposes using PCR, which is the most uh, sensitive technique we have today. But common for PCR and culturing is that they are very lab heavy. So it's, it's not something that you can get an answer of immediately. You actually need to wait several days before you get an answer. And what I discovered during this research study was first of all, that a lot of patients had infections or colonizations. So, so initial bacterial, uh, bacterial cells in their body that they had no clue about because the, the, the regular diagnostic methods aren't very sensitive. And the other finding or the other, uh, the other impression I got there was that when I was testing at the hospital, the nurses would sometimes come to me and ask, can you please tell us the result of this patient? Can you please tell us if this patient is positive or negative? And it's because they really wanted to know how to treat this, this specific patient because it will take several days be before they get an answer and they don't want to wait for that. Of course, here I wasn't allowed to share the information because the method wasn't validated, but it, 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 it really made an impression because if we could do something to have on-spot diagnostic tools in clinics or even at the patient's homes, then we would be able to catch bacterial infections early and maybe in this way we, the doctors would have a chance to treat uh, um, the infections be before they became very, very severe. So I, I thought at this point that uh, I could use all of my know-how to establish a company called Prediagnose. And the purpose of this company was to create diagnostic tools that were, that were able to, to diagnose infections on the spot and very early, early in the process. The concept uh, would be that we have nano-modified sensors where they are, and they are disposable. So this, the patient should be able to just place a sample on the sensor, plug it into a device, it press start and get an answer within 30 seconds. And the answer would be displayed on a mobile phone uh, through a mobile application. So it should be very, very simple. But all of this, all of this nano modification, all of this technology relied on detecting what the bacteria were saying to each other. Because bacteria, they talk. 
and they send signal and mo signaling molecules to each other in order to count how many they are and in order to know if they are many enough to initiate something pathogenic, something that will cause a severe disease. So they coordinate between them. And this is very, very interesting because they send out molecules, the molecules are recognized by the cells, then they have a response to that and so on. And by detecting these molecules, we would be able to say if there is an infection or if these molecules are specific for certain bacteria. But in order to, to, to make an impact, especially for, for bacterial cells, in order to make impact in the human body, which is huge compared to, to bacterial cells, they need to reach a certain point where they are many enough to, to make this impact. So in the beginning of a growth of bacteria, as you see here, they, they, they don't really produce anything pathogenic. But at, at a specific point, they all together produce these very vol voluble mo molecules that, uh, that creates uh, the disease or the, uh, and is actually the cause of the symptoms sometimes that we see in patients. So this was kind of a new approach to, to create these on the spot diagnostic tools. And uh, in a very short time, we, we, developed, um, uh, we, we developed the technology, we, developed, we made uh, clinical, small clinical studies, and our work got a lot of attention both in Denmark and, and outside Denmark. And um, we got a lot of prizes. I came on the Forbes 30 on the 30 list. Uh, I was nominated as the entrepreneur of the year. And basically in a very short time, we were able to create uh, a prototype, a functional prototype. We made um, a, an app that was able to convert these signals and analyze them and give a result uh, that is understandable. We even fabricated our own sensors and we built a lab from scratch with all the necessary and the state of the art tools uh, that are needed for, for developing uh, these sensors. So what can we use this for other than diagnostics? And in my opinion, I think we can, we can use nanosensors to investigate how the course of infections um, uh, are, are developing just by looking into biobanks. Biobanks are time machines to the past. And if we have samples from patients over time, we'll be able to understand how, bacterial, how bacteria developed over time. So just as a research tool, with this would be very powerful to help us predict the course of an infection. Just to give you an example, this is data from, uh, from uh, the, uh, my former group where I did my PhD. Um, they isolated uh, bacteria from, from patients over time, and then they investigated the bacteria, how the bacterial uh, genes developed. So this is one single patient uh, that was diagnosed with uh, cystic fibrosis in 2007. Cystic fibrosis is a disease that, uh, that makes the patient very vulnerable to, to infections. This patient got infected with a bacteria called Pseudomonas aeruginosa in 2008. And this infection, it stayed in the lungs of this patient until 2009, where the, the, it, and this was the last time that the doctors could confirm that this patient was infected with this bacteria. And then for a long time, the infection disappeared, but at some point it came back and it came back in a way that it was very difficult to eradicate. So this patient was chronically infected at this point and by investigate, investigating the, the, the bacteria bioinformatically, they could with certainty say that it was the same bacteria all along. 
So it never really disappeared. It was just not possible to diagnose with the tools available today. And here my claim is that if we have something so sensitive and something that is that can be used to measure frequently, we would be able, we, we may have been able to detect the bacteria in between because they, we, we think, or theoretically the bacteria would still develop these molecules to communicate with each other even in between uh, um, uh, isolation of the bacteria. So early diagnosis, it is not the only way we can combat um, AMR. If we want to do it correctly, we need to utilize the full potential of our research and knowledge. And we have well-established biobanks of bacteria in the world, but we still lack well-coordinated efforts to understand bacterial, bacterial communication. And therefore, I would like to propose a center for translation of bacterial communication. This is something we can use to coordinate our activities. We can have leading microbiologists, leading uh, scientists from different fields, clinicians, even pol politicians that can make some, some uh, uh, decisions with bases in our science to actually understand and, and defeat this. Because if we don't intensify our efforts like we, we are doing now with COVID-19, it will be very, very difficult to, to do it later on when it's already too late. So we, we need to intensify our efforts. And I think by a center like this, we may be able to have a chance. The center aims would be to collect quorum sensing molecules and even discover new ones. It would be to map how these molecules are secreted, how they are produced and in which context. Sometimes uh, they, they differ, the concentrations would differ, they, they, uh, depending on uh, which context it is, which patient it is, how, how they behave when there is competition from other species. All of this would influence the, the quorum sensing, this, this phenomena of, of uh, bacterial communication. We would um, use these quorum sensing molecules to do early diagnosis because the, the, these molecules are secreted even in the early phases before the infection is established. So if we are able to use these molecules as, a, as predictors of upcoming infections, we might be able to, we, we may be able to um, treat with very low concentrations or very low doses of antibiotics and in this way manage our resources in another way than we are doing today. We could develop alternatives to antibiotics. There is actually already something called uh, quorum quenching. And it's, uh, if, if we use a, a metaphor for it, if the bacteria cannot hear each other, they will not be able, able to coordinate their activities. And if they're not able to coordinate their activities, it will be very different, difficult for them to establish infections. So this is another way, instead of using antibiotics, we use something else to block the bacteria from coordinating their activities. We could use biobanks, our existing biobanks, and maybe new biobanks to, to, um, to investigate how bacteria develop over time and use this to predict courses of infections in, in, in uh, patients today. And finally, we would use this to, to really translate bacterial communication, to understand from the bacteria themselves how, what to do about this problem uh, of resistance. So in my opinion, this will be a combination of basic research and applied translational research. And by doing so, we, we may be able to implement real strategies for what to do um, with this problem. And we may even, it may even be possible to introduce new bacterial species or well-designed probiotics that can speak to the bacteria 
and maybe our peace. So back to my daughter, um, she got the antibiotics and she became well again. And we even celebrated her very first birthday in South Korea. And it was, it was just an amazing trip. And yeah, we, we, in this specific case, it was important to treat. But at some point we may be, it might not even be possible to treat such cases and it will be more severe cases that we will need to say no to the treatment because the situation will develop if we don't do something now. So for the sake of our children, we need to unite our efforts and we need to think in innovative ways, even if it means that we learn from the bacteria themselves and hear them speak and understand from, the, from them what to do about this. If you want to know more about my research, I did a TED talk. Uh, please listen, listen to it if you're interested. And thank you very much. I look forward to, to further discuss this subject with you. Thank you.